Hey guys, and welcome back to Monday Warfare, the battles within, as we continue to chronicle the weekly episodic Monday Night War saga, and this week we're going to talk all about August 5th in 1996, WCW Nitro versus WWF Monday Night Raw, and I am your host, Ray Russell, going to bring it all to you guys. But first, before we get going, just a reminder that you can listen to Monday Warfare, the battles within, and our sister shows like the Wrestling Memory Grenade currently covering 1987 in the World Wrestling Federation, already in the month of September of 1987. Where will we go next? Stay tuned. Continue to listen to the Wrestling Memory Grenade. You can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. Currently have two projects going on right now over at Regional Wrestling, talking about 1981 and Georgia Championship Wrestling with guest co-host Jamie Ward, also talking the Mid-South Wrestling Territory, now the UWF, with guest co-host Roman Gomez back in the year of 1986. And you can listen to all of those shows and more as part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Google, and beyond. You can also follow me on social media, Follow me on Twitter at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. Also, follow and like me at Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. Follow me on social media for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm also constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history. Speaking of videos, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can find me there at YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade, uploading new footage all the time as I continue to preserve my old VHS collection by converting it all to streaming digital. Most recently on YouTube, I've dropped a few more goodies from 1987 in the WWF. We continue to chronicle all of the 1986 TV for the Mid-South Wrestling Territory, and last but certainly not least, added a matchup just before he arrived in the WWF back in 1985 of King Kong Bundy in the New Japan promotion, taking on Hulk Hogan, the WWF champion, Back in February of 1985, and it's really fun watching Bundy come out with that Dracula cape in tow. And you guys can check out all of those videos and so much more over there at youtube.com slash wrestling grenade. Subscribe today. Speaking of subscriptions, now would be a tremendous time to become a WrestleCopia patron. You can find me there at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. Multiple tiers to choose from, guys. But I'm only asking you to give it a try at that $5 all-access tier. Get you all of my insanely detailed show notes, book-like show notes. We're talking pages upon pages of research and reviewing for the Wrestling Memory Grenade, Regional Wrestling, and of course Monday Warfare as well. You also get early access to many of the podcasts here on WrestleCopia. Listen days and sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners. But we're not done yet. You'll also get remastered versions of the earliest episodes of the Grenade podcast covering the 1989 NWA project. Includes enhanced sound quality and new content and conversations. Originally edited out of the initial broadcast due to time restraints, edited right back into the show. But that's not all. You also get digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. Always a popular part of the Patreon experience, the digital downloads. And of course, you'll also get the Patreon-exclusive Watch Along series, covering many past WWF and WCW pay-per-views, Coliseum videos, Saturday Night's main events, Clash of the Champions, and so much more. And you get all of that, guys, for the low, low price of just $5. It's early access, insanely detailed show notes for three of the podcast shows, plus Patreon-exclusive watch-alongs, remastered episodes with new content added in, digital downloads, plus random bonus video drops, newspaper clippings. You never know what I'm going to add there to the all-access tier. You get all of that and so much more for just $5. No subscription. Cancel any time. Show your support. Give me a try for a month. I think you'll like and appreciate the content that I offer. And every penny of it, guys, goes right back here into funding the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Help me keep all of these shows and more up and running for the months and the years to come. And now with all of that said, all of that out of the way, it's time to jump back in to Monday Warfare, and I do apologize, guys. I meant to drop this show last week, but life got in the way. Lots of things going on around the household right now. We're having the insides painted. Of course, I've been doing the yard work, getting the house looking nice for the summer. Also, 
cleaning out the garage, cleaning out the storage room in the basement, doing a whole lot of things, and even uh, converting, as I said, a lot of my videos over to digital. It's been a very busy time here in the household. So I do apologize. And it almost looked like I wasn't going to get this show out here today, recorded today, because my wife, she threw a curveball at me at the very last minute yesterday. She informed me she was off of work today. And I thought, well, there goes that, because honey-do lists around the corner. But nope, she had some things to do herself. She's out for the next few hours, and that gives me the time to record this show in the interim. So, that said, got to get this in. Away we go with some WWF news, as we already have an update on Ahmed Johnson. Remember the kidney injury? We learned that Johnson had emergency kidney surgery on August the 6th. That'll take place the day after this episode of TV. And he was in intensive care for several hours. Ahmed expected to be out of action for about three months at this point, And he returned home after surgery by the end of the week. So Ahmed's going to be okay. We know he'll return before the end of the year. As uh, we'll see clips of the surgery on the upcoming August 12th edition of Monday Night Raw. So we'll talk about that next time here on Monday Warfare. Which leads us to our next piece of business involving the Intercontinental title. Remember, Johnson is the IC champion. Well, the Intercontinental title will be vacated on an upcoming episode of TV. And a new champion will be determined pending a tournament. And thus, with that news, we have even more Ahmed Johnson news here. As the matchup schedule for SummerSlam between the IC champion Ahmed Johnson and Ron Simmons, a.k.a. Farouk Assad. As for that matchup at SummerSlam, well, obviously it's not going to take place. And with the IC title now vacated, Simmons won't be challenging anyone for the belt. In fact, he won't be wrestling anyone at SummerSlam anymore. The match has been canceled, guys, completely. And Ron Simmons will not be part of the SummerSlam pay-per-view, at least not in the wrestling ring. And while we're on the topic of injuries, and this is unfortunate as well, we talked about Ahmed and the kidney surgery. Well, another major injury occurred recently involving Skip of the body Donna's Chris Candido. He's going to suffer a cracked vertebrae in his neck on the upcoming August 9th Madison Square Garden show. The injury going to occur when Skip takes the Sidewinder Slam from these smoking guns. He was taken to the hospital after the show and put in a neck brace as a press time. When this was announced on the observer, when it first went down, it wasn't certain how long that Candida would be out of action or how the SummerSlam show would go, how it would be affected. Would Skip be pulled as well? Well, spoiler alert guys, he's not though. He probably should have been. Of course, Skip scheduled for that four corners elimination matchup involving the tag teams of the WWF. And as we'll see, the injury never announced here on Raw. And as I was doing a deep dive, getting ready for this episode of Monday Warfare, I may have found some shotgun Saturday night origins here, as it appears the World Wrestling Federation all the way back in the summer of 96 was considering adding a weekly Saturday night, listen to this, pay-per-view, according to several sources within the company and an independent trade journal report as well. The experimental one-hour show, wow, a one-hour pay-per-view? Really, Vince? The experimental one-hour show, which current plans have, if it does transpire, would be done live every Saturday night from New York City starting at midnight. The show would be heavily aimed at the adult audience, which most take to meaning a more risque ECW-like television product, and because of that, may mean the show would be shown on the West Coast at midnight rather than live. So some interesting thoughts here, maybe kicking off the shotgun show as a pay-per-view of sorts, a weekly pay-per-view, maybe $4.95, I certainly, hopefully not $10, but trying to give the fans some of their fill for ECW type product. More on shotgun as the months progress. Right now, we're also going to talk, we we mentioned this a couple episodes ago, the issues between Shawn Michaels and Jim Cornette, the drama, it seems to have settled a bit here as we head into the month of August. So we touched on the issues with Shawn Michaels insisting that Jim Cornette bumped early as Shawn went to throw a super kick, thus making HBK look like a fool, while on the other end, Corny swore that he tripped and fell. Well, that coupled with the story about Cornette coming into a California bar, along with Dave Meltzer, probably didn't help a lot, but Cornette arriving at a bar that Shawn Michaels was also at while the two have been feuding behind the scenes didn't help the matters. And neither did having the melts with you either, Corny. Well, since that time, it's reported that Sean also thought that Cornette was inserting too much input into HBK's matches as of late. 
And I could see that being a thing. Jim Cornette was very hands-on with anything he was involved in. I'm sure he meant well. Not that I have to defend Corny, but Shawn Michaels, he uh, didn't like to be told what to do, even if you were just giving him ideas. At least that's what I've heard. Regardless, it's reported the two men seem to be working fine together now in the recent matches on the house show, so we'll keep an eye on it for the time being. As we roll on just a few more pieces of news here, here and there we'll call it, it appears that WWF superstars will be leaving syndicated TV and moving to the USA Network on cable. The world is changing as the WWF now focusing more on their cable programming. And of course, syndicated TV, they've bumped the WWF programs all around at this point. Many local markets have even dropped it due to the ratings over the last, say, three years. For instance, in my market up here in Northeastern Ohio, Superstars for years was a staple every Saturday morning, 11 o'clock a.m. You could set your watch to it. But when the ratings and the, and the stuff they were putting on the air started to decline throughout 93, 94, and certainly into 95, we lost Superstars on our big-time local market. It went to a secondary channel about 45 minutes out from here. So we kind of got that little, remember the old antenna snow, for those who know, the struggle? Remember that, guys? We got that on a, a somewhat local channel still. But it went from 11 a.m. on Saturday mornings to another channel a little further away. I want to say somewhere around 7 or 8 p.m. on Saturday evenings. And even then, it was bumped more often than not for other programming. So it was getting rough in the syndicated market here for Vince. So it's a good thing that TV itself, a lot of it was starting to transition over to cable was more of a thing here by the mid-1990s, to say the least. And superstars come the new fall season here in 96 headed to the USA Network. Also, more news here. Vince McMahon apparently flew to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, a few weeks back to finalize deals with Brett the Hitman Hart's new contract and pending storyline upon his return. It's also stated here in recent observers and the pro wrestling torch that Duke the Dumpster Drossy has, in fact, quit the WWF and has worked out some indie dates back in Florida. You say quit, they say fired, whatever the case may be, the dumpster gone from the World Wrestling Federation. And in our last piece of news, we talked about this last week, maybe two episodes ago. The Bruise Brothers, Ron and Don Harris, they got crew cuts. Oh, don't tell me, guys, you cut off those giant afros? Yes, the Bruise Brothers, crew cuts now for their reappearance here in the World Wrestling Federation. Paul E., he didn't even get to do an angle with it. They just shaved their heads. And as of press time here, it's not known what their gimmick will be. Well, the, the gimmick is they have no gimmick. They are, I believe it was Jason and Jared Grimm, the Grimm twins. Yeah, that'll get over. It's classic, pal. I digress as we roll on WWF Monday Night Raw. Here we go. August the 5th, tape back July 22nd at the Key Arena, Seattle, Washington. Vince McMahon and Jim Ross on commentary here this week. We'll see why in just a minute. And we kick things off with a video package of Mark Henry, Dateline Atlanta. Atlanta? Huh. Take that, Ted Turner. Pal. Vince McMahon announces a new 10-year, multi-million dollar deal with Mark Henry, dubbed the world's strongest man, the latest star to join the WWF. And we'll see some ups and downs with Mark Henry here all throughout the Monday Night War. And of course, Henry going to have better years coming in the 2000s, but right now, we head back to 1996, making his way down to ringside, Jerry the King Lawler, slated to take on the Portuguese man of war, Aldo Montoya, and this is a rematch from eight days ago on Superstars, when Aldo pinned the king after using Jake the Snake Roberts' DDT finisher. How's that for continuity? And here we go, it's the king out to ringside, grabbing the house mic, and of course, ripping apart Jake the Snake Roberts' in front of the fans in the arena, holding a paper bag. But what's in that bag? We won't have to wait long to see. Out next, the protege of Jake, of sorts. It's Aldo Montoya, as Lawler points out that Aldo doesn't drink, but shows off Jake's tag team partner as he pulls a bottle of Jim Beam out of the bag. Not a bad tag team partner to have. Of course, I prefer Jack Daniels, but that's just me. Lawler continues to bury Jake and Aldo on the mic before offering the man o' war a rebuttal. But as Montoya goes to take the microphone, the king drops the mic, and Aldo stupidly bends over to pick it up. Don't do that, Aldo. 
And with Aldo bending over to grab the mic, he eats a kick right to the face from the king. And that sucker shot puts Lawler in control, but he telegraphs a backdrop and Montoya unloads. Nice drop kick and flying fist drop off the top rope. Aldo looking for the DDT again here on Monday Night Raw, the same move he used to defeat the king not too long ago, but Lawler manages to escape. But the Man O'War manages to stay in control. However, eventually it is Montoya this time telegraphing his own backdrop and the King countering straight into a pile driver. But he's not done yet. Lawler picking Montoya up for a second pile driver. Double your pleasure, double your fun, at least for the King. Jerry Lawler going to pick up the quick win here in just 2 minutes and 33 seconds. More of an angle than a match, but... We're not done yet. Post-match, Lawler pouring the raw whiskey down the throat of Aldo Montoya as Vince McMahon exclaims, he doesn't even drink. Yeah, dear God, pal. What a heel, Jerry Lawler dumping whiskey down the throat of Aldo Montoya as Jim Ross states, drug and alcohol abuse are nothing to be made fun of. Oh yeah? Says who, pal? So Aldo, for the umpteenth time, playing the backdrop for one of Jerry Lawler's feuds. I think he's ate Jerry Lawler's feet. Now he's drinking whiskey. Well, that'll kill the uh, taste of the toes. But a fun little segment there and another angle to set up what's going to be announced as Jake the Snake Roberts taking on Jerry the King Lawler at SummerSlam. And right now we head back to the ring tag team action. It's going to be the Body Donnas. This is before Skip's injury. So it is a healthy Skip and Zip taking on the new rockers of Marty Jannetty and Leaf Cassidy. But Jannetty correcting the ring announcer, they are not the new rockers. In fact, they are the new and improved rockers. Thank you very much. Is Hillbilly Jim out to join for commentary as we have all of the WWF tag team scheduled for that four-corner match at SummerSlam? The Donnas, the Rockers, the Godwins, and the Guns. Hillbilly stating Phineas has seen the light and he won't be fooled by Sonny no more. And speaking of Sonny, we get Sonny and Farouk. They also cut in with a live insert promo during this matchup. Farouk meets Skip right here next week on Raw as Sonny says that Skip simply didn't measure up to her needs. I wrote, wow. Farouk goes on a good little promo here. He says he doesn't care if it's Skip or Dip that he gets in the ring with. He doesn't discriminate against any man or any color. He's the true king of the jungle, a tiger, because tigers. They hunt alone. They don't need to travel in packs. And the best part about a tiger? It's a man-eater, like Ron Simmons. Damn! So that was actually a pretty fun promo, a throwaway here. Just too bad it was tossed in as an insert here during a matchup. During this match, we also see the Smoking Guns and the Godwins, the other two teams in that four-corner match. They're backstage watching from their locker rooms on the monitors preparing for SummerSlam. So talk about fitting a lot into one match. We've got promos. We've got guest commentators. We've got guys watching in the back. Lots of moving parts throughout this matchup. And we're still not even done with the cut-ins during this match. As we also see Gorilla Monsoon. We're back to this meeting again. Gorilla finally agrees to reluctantly, but immediately reinstate Clarence Mason's client. Monsoon warns Mason, though, that His client will be under scrutiny by the WWF officials, especially Gorilla Monsoon. So a probation of sorts here for Mason's man, but that doesn't bother Clarence, who turns and smiles at his client. Uh, Boy, this meeting has gone on forever between Clarence Mason and Gorilla Monsoon. Crush's legs have to be tired. He's been standing there for seemingly weeks now, at least a few weeks. And poor Gorilla, I hope he's getting overtime for this meeting. It just seems to go on forever. And remember, guys, this is pre-recorded from A few weeks ago, I wrote, do they really have to show a pre-recorded meeting during a matchup? Well, they're not wasting time on this program, that's for sure. But believe it or not, guys, there's also a match to be had here. Remember, it's the body Donnas taking on the Rockers? Well, as the Donnas begin to make their way out for their entrance, we find that the Rockers have left the ring. They're back by the entranceway, hiding by the raw entrance sign, and they attack the Donnas as they come through the curtains. And then once we get to the ring, the Rockers picking Zip up for a double suplex, but dropping him rib first on the top rope. And then things break down early on with all four men in the ring. It appears the Donnas are about to take control, Zip whipping Janetti off the ropes for a dropkick, but 
Cassidy grabs partner Marty, and Zipster misses that dropkick, landing on the back of his head. Good double team heel work there by the Rockers, Al Snow saving Marty Jannetty. And there's some decent stuff going on in the ring here. While the announcers are busy navigating through all the insert promos and VTRs that I already talked about, but the Donnas with a poor man's double goozle and Marty back trying a flying head scissors on Skip, but Skip actually cartwheeling through the move and landing on his feet. And then from there, Skip, Chris Candido, with a hurricane rana of his own. But Janetti lands at his own corner and tags out to Leaf Cassidy. As the Rockers do a convoluted spot next, where they keep trying to outwit the Donnas but keep missing their moves. Again, a little too convoluted for TV for my taste, but Janetti busting out the old diamond dust on Skip out of the corner. Very cool. But Candido right back in, dropping Janetti to the mat and landing a diving headbutt off the top. Going to give Candido the one, two, but Leaf Cassidy in to break up the count on Marty Janetti. Skip then up for another Hurricane Rana on Janetti, but Cassidy this time reaching up over the ropes, grabbing Skip by his head and aiding Marty in dropping Skip down across the top rope, an assisted hot shot, if you will, as Skip then to the outside, and Cassidy with a running, swinging neckbreaker on the floor, and there was really no room to bump here for the spot, so a dangerous spot, but it did look awesome. As Skip then rolls back inside, Marty Jannetty going to make the cover, one, two, but Candido gets his foot on the ropes. As the Rockers continue on with more high-impact maneuvers here, good double-teaming and heel work by the new and improved Rockers. And at one point, Skip lunges at Zip, Tom Pritchard, for a tag, but jumps into an Al Snow spinebuster. Great spot as we head into a commercial break. As we see a plug for Stridex SummerSlam sweepstakes. Sorry, I was an oxy man. And then back from break, all of a sudden, all four men in the ring. Leaf Cassidy climbing up to the top rope, but Marty Jannetty whipped into the ropes at the same time by Skip, which causes Marty's own partner, Cassidy, to lose balance and get crotched on the top turnbuckle. So Jannetty inadvertently causing his own partner to crotch himself on the top rope. And then Marty charging at Skip, but back dropped out to the floor, leaving the Donnas to look for their finisher on Leaf Cassidy. Skip up top. Top rope Hurricane Rana since Cassidy down to the mat and now Zip up top looking for that diving bombs away that butt drop from the top rope. Going to finish Cassidy off here, but the smoking guns hit the ring, shoving Zip off the top rope and attack the body Donnas for the disqualification. About nine and a half minutes shown of maybe an 11 minute matchup. I wrote, damn, we went through all of that for a finish like that? A disqualification here. The body done is going to pick up the win due to the smoking guns interference. Speaking of the guns, it is the guns and the rockers. They begin to do a four on two beatdown on Skip and Zip until the Godwins arrive to even the numbers. A precursor to SummerSlam as the baby faces clear the ring. And as I go back and I dissect this match, not the actual wrestling, but the people involved, you, you've got arguably four of the best to ever do their thing. Marty Janetti. Al Snow in his prime years, Tom Pritchard, and Chris Candido. To expect this match not to be fundamentally sound would be silly. And it was good, but nothing near what it could have been outside of the WWF bubble. And this match was better than the response it got from the fans as well. But that's where we're at here with the tag division right now. Which, sad to say, is unfortunate. As Raw rolls on up next, Kevin Kelly has a sit down interview with the WWF champion, the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. Kelly asking Shawn after being pinned by Vader at the In Your House International Incident and attacked by Mankind here on TV. Kelly asking if Shawn's run as champion is beginning to crumble. But Michaels thinks he's at his best when he's backed against the wall. Shawn says he has never professed to be invincible or unbeatable. He's just a regular, everyday guy who just happens to wrestle for the WWF. Sean knows as WWF champion, he can be beaten on any given day, but he continues to take on all comers, and with the click and Jose Lothario on his side, that's all he needs. Kevin Kelly then asking Sean about the critics, stating HBK's win over the Hitman at WrestleMania 12 was tainted. Sean replies that that's what critics do. Critics criticize. But Michaels hopes that Brett does return to the World Wrestling Federation 
The WWF without the Hitman is like peanut butter without the jelly. Kevin Kelly then asking Sean about the upcoming Battle Royal on Raw and having to face the person the following night should Sean make it through Vader at SummerSlam. Michael's response, he thinks he's the only one currently on the roster who can handle the schedule of the champion, which I'm sure he actually meant. Nothing really big came out of this, but this was actually not the originally scheduled segment for Raw here tonight. Originally planned was a recorded Ticking Time Bomb interview segment with Brian Pillman interviewing Shawn Michaels instead, which reportedly didn't come off well, so it was pulled and replaced with this. The idea was that Pillman would host the new version of Piper's Pit with his own Ticking Time Bomb talk show segment, but I guess this one didn't work for Vince, so we got this Kevin Kelly interview instead with HBK as we roll on one more match this week, but it's really all we need. It's big time, guys. A number one contender, Raw Invitational Battle Royal. The winner to meet the WWF champion, Shawn Michaels or Vader, the night following SummerSlam. And the participants include The Undertaker, Mankind, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Remember, this was recorded prior to the surgery. So Intercontinental Champion Ahmed Johnson also in this one, plus Savio Vega, Gold Dust, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog, the wild man Mark Marrow, Justin Hawk Bradshaw getting thrown a bone here, and last but certainly not least, Psycho Sid. 11 men. What an odd number. And the last man to be introduced, The Undertaker, runs to the ring. But you don't see that every day. Undertaker running to the ring to get his hands on mankind. And Taker, with his own version of the cactus clothesline, oh, the irony, right out of the gate. Taker clotheslines Foley over the top rope and falls out with them, so both Undertaker and Mankind eliminated out of the match almost immediately. Seriously, guys, less than 10 seconds into the match, and then the two men brawl all the way back to the locker room. And don't worry, that's not the last time we're going to see him here tonight, but two of the biggest names in the matchup already eliminated, two down, nine still to go. As Ahmed Johnson next tossing the British Bulldog out like nothing, like a bitch really here, just one minute and nine seconds into the matchup, I wrote, wow, that's all I could say. I'm just tossing the Bulldog out. Bulldog clearly not part of the plans at this point. As uh, the Battle Royal continues on from there, it's Psycho Sid backdropping Justin Hawk Bradshaw out of the ring at two minutes and 26 seconds. And the action continues on until the wild man Mark Marrow tossing Owen Hart over the top rope, but Owen skinning the cat back inside, broken hand and all. What a trooper, huh? Wearing the cast and Owen Hart still managing to skin the cat with that injured arm. Very impressive, Owen. But as Hart skins the cat back in the ring, he turns around and Mark Merrow still standing there, clotheslining Owen back out a second time, and this time, the Rocket, the King of Hearts, the two-time Slammy Award winner, Owen Hart, eliminated from the match four minutes and two seconds into the Battle Royal. So that's already five down, but six still remaining as the Battle Royal continues after this commercial break. And then back from break, they likely fast-forwarded the video just enough to get Owen away from ringside, though I doubt we missed very much here, which is cool. And as the action goes on, Marrow charging at Goldust, but he gets backdropped out of the ring and just a little over five minutes into the action. But it's a Battle Royal, guys, so the action rolls on as Savio Vega taking over on Goldust, whipping him hard into the corner, Savio going to follow him in, running in with a spinning kick into the corner, the old quang kick onto Goldust, but the momentum, oh no, sends Savio over the top rope and out to the floor, something we've seen Vega do repeatedly, Vega eliminating himself from the matchup in about 5 minutes and 30 seconds, and he immediately regrets it. So that's two more down, and the final four remaining. Psycho Sid, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Gold Dust, and the IC champion Ahmed Johnson, as we see The Undertaker and Mankind brawling through the crowd now, and then back to ringside, Undertaker flinging Mankind over the guardrail and back to ringside. They even go fighting back into the ring during the Battle Royal and back out the other side again, so a wild fight going on throughout the arena between The Undertaker and Mankind, another precursor here tonight of what we may see at SummerSlam. But back to the ring, the four legal men still in this thing. Goldust with a big lariat on Ahmed Johnson 
as Sid and Steve Austin go at it, and I mark out for it. The heels then double-teaming Psycho Sid, and Austin then with a back leg low blow to Ahmed Johnson, who was coming over to aid Sid, Austin throwing up that leg and low blow there to Ahmed Johnson. And then from there, Austin up to the middle rope, going to drop a big elbow on the IC champion, and one on Sid as well, as the four-man battle continues for some time here. Ahmed, though, busting out the spine buster on the former Intercontinental Champion Goldust, but Goldie managing to escape the Pearl River Plunge as we head into yet another commercial break. And we see the SummerSlam Olympic-style commercial here, Goldust grabbing Triple H's ass, though Triple H somehow blaming Vader for it. Well, I guess he was closer. I said it last time, I'll say it again. I love that commercial. And then we're back from the second commercial break, and this time Sid making the comeback on Goldust, and we do see a powerbomb. Dropping Goldust down to the mat, and then Sid, power bomb on Stone Cold as well. Both men down, courtesy of Psycho Sid. And Sid going to slow things down, working over Austin. Meanwhile, Goldust back up, landing his curtain call finisher on Ahmed Johnson. As we jump backstage to see The Undertaker and Mankind, they continue to brawl up on some pallets, a taste of what to expect in Cleveland, and that boiler room brawl as we see them fight backstage. It's at this point in the Battle Royal, we also learn that next week, the go-home show to SummerSlam, it's WWF champion Shawn Michaels taking on Owen Hart of Camp Cornette. Non-title matchup, Owen looking to soften up HBK for Vader heading into the SummerSlam pay-per-view. And speaking of Owen, Bulldog and Owen here returning ringside in this Battle Royal. They both managed to distract Sid, allowing Steve Austin to sneak up from behind with a clothesline. Clocking Sid in the back of the head, sending him over the top rope and out to the floor in about 13 minutes and 45 seconds or so here into the matchup. So Sid back up on his feet on the outside, chasing both Owen and the Bulldog backstage. Now it's Sid taking on the British Bulldog at SummerSlam, so this plays in there. But with Psycho Sid eliminated, that leaves us two on one here, Gold Dust and Stone Cold taking on Ahmed Johnson it would seem, as they double-team Ahmed down to the mat, but Goldust then, turning on Stone Cold, landing a big lariat, dropping Steve Austin. But Austin, no fool, he comes back with a low blow of his own to the Golden Globes, if you will. With the two heels now going at it, Ahmed Johnson allowed time to recover. Ahmed then grabbing Austin, trying to eliminate him over the top rope. He has Austin hanging on, When out of nowhere, Goldust joins in and helps Ahmed dump Steve Austin out of the ring and down to the floor about 16 minutes into this one. And at this point, we're down to two. Who will meet the champion the night after SummerSlam? Will it be Ahmed Johnson or Goldust? It is the IC champion and the man he beat for that Intercontinental belt. And it looks like Ahmed has re-injured that broken nose as well in this battle royal, which now seems to be bleeding as Goldust takes over control here. Goldust pounding down Ahmed and lands a pile driver as we take, yes, guys, our third commercial break in the match. The only good news about that is we're really not missing a whole lot. This is pre-recorded, and they're not editing a whole lot out, just enough to where you don't realize they're doing it. And then back from break, Goldust celebrating, if you will. Celebrating what? I don't know, because this match isn't over. And Ahmed Johnson jumps up and leaps onto the back of Goldust with a rear naked choke. Okay, weird move for a battle royal. Ahmed Johnson trying to choke out Goldust here. And then once they're back on their feet, Ahmed sending Goldust into the ropes, but Goldie holds on. But that's okay. Johnson going to run at him, uses momentum to try to send Goldust over the top rope. And it does indeed somehow send Goldust over the ropes, but Ahmed damn near knocks himself over with Goldie as well. Only Ahmed. As Johnson begins to lose balance, fall over the top rope, somehow manages to grab hold of the top rope and hangs upside down backwards over the arena floor to hang on, just hang on just enough to win the Battle Royal after around 18 minutes and 30 seconds of action here. So between the cutaways to Taker and Mankind in the back and the commercials, and I can't even begin to get a good idea of the actual length of the Battle Royal, but It was pretty close to around 20 minutes of solid brawling, as you might expect. So there you have it, the IC champion Ahmed Johnson wins the Battle Royal. 
and was scheduled to meet the winner of the Shawn Michaels Vader title match at SummerSlam the following night on Raw. Now, we all know Ahmed out, that won't happen, which is really unfortunate, but I'd love to have seen where they went with that. But the bigger deal here is they're swerving the fans unless they were planning to go with Vader. We'll touch on that when we get to the SummerSlam time frame, but let's go along with the idea that Shawn Michaels was always supposed to win at SummerSlam. It's a great swerve to get everybody to think, oh, Vader's definitely winning the title because Ahmed's not wrestling Shawn. I think that would have made for a very interesting and fun matchup, Ahmed Johnson and Shawn Michaels. And as Ahmed begins to get up after eliminating Goldust and winning the matchup, Vince McMahon straight in the ring with a post-match interview. Going to talk with Ahmed Johnson about his big win here. And Ahmed says he's happy and sad for winning this matchup. He's happy he gets the title shot, potentially against Vader, but sad that it could also be against his friend, Shawn Michaels. Either way, Ahmed says he's going to give it his all. And at that point in the interview, very quickly into the promo, Ahmed and Vince interrupted by Farouk, who comes at Johnson, and the two men begin to brawl in a pull-apart by officials in the ring, Jim Ross on commentary, selling it hard and talking their match at SummerSlam as we fade to black and end the show. And wow, what a three weeks in a row, what a great taping to be a part of after months of not the best action here on Raw, not the best storylines, really not a whole lot of good stuff going on. And then all of a sudden, this entire TV taping has been phenomenal. Really good action. I love the use of all the insert promos and VTRs and things to really keep things going on TV, never really slowing down for the fans at home. The crowd in the arena seem to be into everything, as they should be. It's just been a hell of a TV taping thus far. We'll have to see if that trend continues. we got one more piece of TV next week here. Four hours of TV can be a lot for any fan. We'll see how they respond to the final episode of this TV taping leading into SummerSlam next week. But for right now, it's been a fun ride here on Raw these last three weeks. So I'm just enjoying them while I can. As for segment of the night, was it the action between the Rockers and the Body Donnas? Or maybe it was the Battle Royal. I mean, it was more than half the episode. Three matches here this week, and we really didn't need a whole lot more. They filled in the open spot there with the Shawn Michaels interview with Kevin Kelly. Really a throwaway, if you ask me. I'm a big fan of Jerry Lawler, so the king can do no wrong with me. Fun little quick segment. Again, two and a half minutes was the matchup against Aldo Montoya. They got their point across setting up Jake and Jerry Lawler for SummerSlam. And I talked about how great of a matchup Al Snow, Marty Jannetty, Chris Candido, and Tom Pritchard would be in another promotion. And they do their best here working with what they can. But it's safe to say everything on this show overshadowed by the Battle Royal 11 big names. Well, 10 big names and Bradshaw, still fairly new to the company, gets thrown a bone here because he is a big man, 300 pounds and pretty tall at that. Bradshaw certainly fit into this Battle Royal and they weren't playing around here. Winner meets the WWF champion after SummerSlam and they only fed you names that you wanted or maybe wanted to see or would at least believe in a matchup for the WWF title. They didn't really insult our intelligence with a Phineas Godwin or a TL Hopper, or who? The wrestler, not the question mark. So segment of the night, I think it goes without saying. It's got to be the Battle Royal won by Ahmed Johnson. It's just unfortunate what happens to Johnson after this TV taping. As we move on to the other side of the fence, WCW, World Championship Wrestling News, and right out of the gate, bang! Diamond Dallas Page. It's reported that he wants to do a deal where he would be the Stevie Richards, the flunky to the nature boy, Ric Flair. But Flair is said to not be so hot on that storyline right now. Imagine that as Flair in that scenario would be Paige's benefactor. Remember that story? Paige went poor. He went broke. He was seemingly homeless at one point. And then all of a sudden came this mysterious benefactor who fronted Paige the needs to get himself back here into world championship wrestling. And over the last couple of months, that storyline is seemed to have disappeared, and apparently Paige pushed for that benefactor to be Ric Flair, but Ric Flair said, "Uh uh-uh, I don't want any part of that. I got my own things going on right here with the Macho Man and the NWO. But that could have been fun. We go on just a couple more bits of WCW news here. Lord Steven Regal expected to win the television title from the total package Lex Luger. Remember, he's been holding that TV title all year, ever since Johnny B. Bad made the jump over to the WWF as the wild man Mark Marrow. So Regal expected to win the TV title over the next few weeks, and they'll try and give the belt more prestige again 
since Regal has tours of both England and Japan coming up in September. It's also reported that Regal's being thrown a bone here. He's getting the title because originally he was scheduled to have a storyline with Eddie Guerrero. They were going to do a program together over the United States title. However, the decision was changed to Ric Flair keeping the belt at the upcoming Hog Wild pay-per-view. And DDP, he got himself worked into the program with Eddie Guerrero instead. So it's like that old story, whether you want to believe it or not. Ted DiBiase being given the million-dollar belt because he was promised the WWF title, which went to Randy Savage instead because Honky Tonk Man refused to drop the IC title back to the Macho Man. So Regal promised the TV title because his program with Eddie Guerrero was scrapped in favor of a DDP program with Eddie Guerrero, Flair keeping the U.S. title, and of course this reported DDP program with Guerrero created because Ric Flair didn't want to work with Diamond Dallas Page. And I wrote, wow, DDP all over the place here. Who does DDP know in the higher-ups? Sarcasm, people. More news here. Ted DiBiase going to start with WCW at the end of the month, while Jeff Jarrett won't be legally available until the first week of October. Also, Sean Waltman, the 123 kid, will start as soon as Titan signs off on his release. Now, they were expecting to use the kid as part of that Hog Wild pay per view, but Vince, no fool, doesn't sign off on the kid's release until after the pay per view. And in our last piece of news here this week, I reported last episode that Horace Boulder, the nephew of Hulk Hogan, had signed with WCW. Well, you can now also add Leaping Lanny Poffo, the genius, to the list who are now under WCW contract. Although there are no plans of using Lanny, I'm sure he has his brother to thank for that. Dig it, uh aha! As we head into WCW Monday Nitro for August the 5th, Once again, and I believe for the final time in Orlando, Florida, at the Disney MGM Outdoor Studio, as we kick things off, hour number one, it's Tony Schiavone and Larry Zbysko to open the show. As Tony claims, we're one week away removed from the attack from the Outsiders. One week away removed, Tony. I channel my inner David Crockett here when I say, Tony, Tony, Tony. And they open this week's Nitro. Talking last week's NWO attack, announcing that the hired security clearly didn't get the job done last week. Where were they? We never even saw said security. So this week, the WCW wrestlers have taken it upon themselves to step up and act as security for tonight's event. The WCW wrestlers have made a gentleman's agreement, we learn, that whatever happens in the matches or in the ring tonight, it is what it is. But should the NWO get involved, They will unite as one. And here it is, yet another week here on Monday Nitro. Four empty seats shown in the front row. And at this point in real time, 1996, this was getting old fast for me. Very annoying and insulting that I'm gullible enough to keep caring week after week with no payoff in sight. It's like either debut someone or don't. I can honestly say I can go back to 96 and tell you, 1996 me? Didn't give a shit anymore by this point. When it happens, it's going to happen. I'm sick of being strung along. And one thing that doesn't require hindsight about the NWO angle was that they strung these things along too long, not just here, but many times, like the empty chairs deal. But let's not forget, who is in the limo? Don't even get me started on that one. But back to WCW security as they make their way out to ringside. It's Ming. Well, that that should be enough alone, but Barbarian along with them? And then Scott Flash Norton? And Big Bubba? No Trubba. So Ming, if that wasn't enough, his good buddy Barbarian out there, they could probably wipe the entire fan base out here in Orlando. And then Scott Norton, add him to the mix, and then Big Bubba going to round things out there. So you have to assume we're not going to see the Outsiders anywhere near ringside tonight, but we will. Have to wait and see what happens there. As we head to the ring, our first matchup, it's tag team champions Harlem Heat with Sister Sherry and Colonel Rob Parker in their corner. They're going to take on Ricky and Robert, the Rock and Roll Express here. Wow, Rock and Roll Express on Monday Nitro in 1996 yet again. As uh, Rob Parker clearly now dyeing his hair a dark brown color now. As Sherry using his handkerchief to dry the sweat off his face and fan him off during the match as he insists on wearing that suit 
in the hot Orlando sun. He is drenched in sweat. He even takes his hat off at one point here, and his hair just drenched in sweat. What a trooper, that Colonel Rob Parker, as the action begins with the quicker the Heat Booker T stepping in and running over Ricky Morton early on. But the Rock and Rolls realize it's going to take some teamwork here, so they double-team Booker with a double back elbow and a double clothesline. Sends T over the top rope and out to the floor as we head into a commercial break. And then back from break, the Rock and Rolls now working over the leg of Stevie Ray, who finally cuts Morton off and tags back to brother Booker, the Heat now in control of the match as Stevie distracting Ricky Morton. And as Morton turns around, it's Booker with the Harlem sidekick. Ooh, that thrust kick nearly taking Morton's face off. And if the sidekick wasn't enough, up next, Booker then landing the scissor kick to the back of Ricky's head, going to get him a two count. Then Stevie Ray in with some power moves. Gorilla press slam, going to get Stevie Ray a two count here on Ricky Morton. Booker then taking time to ask his two managers to concentrate on the match instead of each other. So the ongoing saga between Rob Parker and Sherry at ringside will continue. But back to the action. Ricky Morton tries to make a comeback here, but he eats a second side thrust kick from Booker T, another Harlem sidekick, and T going up to the middle rope, but misses a diving elbow. And finally, Morton able to hot tag out to Robert Gibson. And Gibson in with a big backdrop on Booker and an insigiri on Stevie Ray as the rock and rolls in full effect. The double drop kick on Booker T. They land their finisher. Gibson making the cover, but the referee busy getting Morton back to his corner. And Sherry reaching in, attempting to kiss Robert Gibson. We've seen her do a lot of that lately. She did it to Dick Slater recently, and apparently Rob Parker has abandoned Rough and Ready for that instance. So Sherry trying to kiss Gibson here, but Robert Gibson shoving Sherry off the apron with authority, mind you. And down goes Sherry on the outside which upsets Rob Parker, or maybe it was the kiss. Either way, Parker is hot and he's up on the apron, but Gibson knocking the colonel off as well. Robert then turning around into a Stevie Ray pump boot right to the face. Down goes Gibson and Booker makes the cover. The Heat going to steal the win in 11 minutes. Wow, an 11-minute matchup here between Harlem Heat and the Rock and Roll Express. And not going to lie, guys, wasn't really offensive. Fun little matchup for TV anyway. But back to the entrance way, Mean Gene Oakland standing by with Brian Knobs and Jerry Sags, the Nasty Boys. Gene talks the Nasty's relationship behind the scenes with Hulk Hogan. And it was news to me, at least back then. Gene wants to know, where is the Nasty Boys' allegiance? Is it with WCW or the NWO? Good question, as Sting and Lex Luger are out confronting the Nasties, and they want to know themselves where the Nasty Boys stand. But the Nasty Boys tell them it's none of their stinking business. Knob says they don't condone what Hulk Hogan did, but they're not saying there's anything wrong with it either. So the Nasty Boys leaving it up in the air. As the show continues on, our world is about to change. Yes, it's the Glacier promo. Same one, bunch of martial arts stances here. And at this point, when I was watching this episode of Nitro, my 22-year-old son walks in the room and asks me, so he's Sub-Zero? I said, yeah. He goes, they didn't even try to change it? That's coming from someone who had never seen Glacier before. He figured it out in like five seconds. Enough said. Now, as for the Glacier character, he is coming, guys. Or maybe not. Who cares at this point? I feel for Ray Lloyd. Back to the ring. Oh, we saw this one just a few weeks ago, and I was pretty impressed that time. But here we go, a rematch here of sorts. It's Medusa taking on Malaya Hosaka. This time, she's accompanied to the ring by Sonny Ono. And like I said, we saw this a few weeks back, and it was short, but it was fun with Hosaka playing the heel then. But this time, she's back and looking good. And this time, she has Sonny Ono with her. Obviously, Ono managing Bull Nakano at Hog Wild against Medusa. So they plug him in here with Hosaka to make it look like they're here to soften up Medusa for the pay-per-view. And the action gets going. It's back and forth early on. The ladies counters and strikes. Hosaka looks right at home here in prime time. Great job by Malaya. Great heel work, using the ropes to her advantage and stepping on the throat of Medusa before catapulting her throat first up into the bottom rope. Then from there, a USA chant breaks out as Medusa makes the comeback with a spin kick. But Hosaka is quick to come back and works the right leg of Medusa. Some would call that the wrong leg, if you know what I mean. 
And locking in the figure four leg lock here is Hosaka on Medusa, but Malaya eventually releasing the submission hold, but continues to work the right leg of Medusa. And it's at this point, of course it does, a black limo has backed into the backstage area again this week. I wrote, where is Disney security? As we cut back to the rink, Malaya with a nice sunset flip, but they land near the ropes for the break. And Medusa going to make the comeback again. A middle rope superplex from Ducey as Sonny Ono then hopping up onto the apron. Medusa running at him. Drop kicks Sonny off the apron, but Medusa landing on her back. And Ozaka quick to jump on top, making the cover. And Sonny Ono right there holding the legs down of Dusa as Ozaka going to steal the win in a major upset. Match goes four minutes and 39 seconds. Malaya Hosaka pinning Medusa. So they're tied one and one here on Nitro. And the heels, they take off quick after the matchup and kind of odd booking here. And I guess you put the heel over here since Medusa likely going to win at the pay-per-view, but there's really never a revenge match after this that I recall anyway. And I'm pretty sure Hosaka wasn't even under contract to WCW. So really odd to see her go over here. I don't know if that was a Medusa call or if that was just a planned booking. Not really sure what the situation with that is. But I got to say, very impressed with Hosaka's work. Like I said, I've been following her since right around 1990, 91 on the local indies. And she looked good here. She was ready for her shot here on the big stage. As we go back to the ring this time, it's Alex Wright taking on the crippler, Chris Benoit. He's led to the ring by woman and the lovely Miss Elizabeth. We see a replay of Eddie Guerrero scoring a count-out win just a couple weeks ago over Chris Benoit after Dean Malenko came ringside and posted Benoit headfirst into the steel. As Larry quips, when bone meets steel, bone loses. That it does. And as the match gets going, Benoit with a violent attack in the corner to start, but Wright going to give it right back to him. European uppercuts here from Alex, unloading as he beals Benoit across the ring and a nice high drop kick sends the crippler bailing out to the floor. And there's that limo again. What's in it? Asks Larry Zabisco. Who is in it? Corrects Shivani. But no, Larry is right. What is in the limo this week? We'll have to wait and see. Benoit back in the ring, slapping Alex right hard across the face, but Alex retaliates with a reverse monkey flip and a pair of flying head scissors before Benoit finally dodging a corner charge and taking control for several minutes here, meticulously working over Das Wanderkind. Benoit locking right in an abdominal stretch as Zabisco talks about the great feeling he gets when he hears the ribs pop one at a time when the abdominal stretch is applied correctly. Well, he was the cruncher, after all. Benoit next with a Kamal clutch. Shout out to Shiki, RIP, as we see random shots of Ming and Scott Norton and the others still acting as security at ringside. Don't forget about those guys. All of the security, the WCW wrestlers, with their backs turned to the ring, scoping out for the NWO. And you have to wonder, for those guys, Ming, Barbarian, Norton, Bubba, this had to be a fun time for them standing in the heat for two straight hours. As the action goes on here between the Crippler and Dust Wander Kent, Jimmy Hart randomly comes to ringside, arguing with woman now to come to the back. She's driving someone crazy. Kevin Sullivan implied here we're doing a little shoot work. Work shoot. Certainly turns into a full shoot. But Jimmy Hart pointing to Kevin Sullivan on his tie, tells woman that she's driving someone crazy in the backstage area. Meanwhile, in the ring, Alex Wright in control comes off the top rope with a high elevation leg drop down onto Chris Benoit. I, th I think it was a leg drop anyway. Not really sure what that was supposed to be. I think Alex was waiting for Benoit to move, but he never does. And it looked all kinds of fucked up, which sucks because Wright got insane height on that. Wright could really come off the top rope like nobody else. And with the action still going on in the ring, we cut back to the floor. Dean Malenko joins in with Jimmy Hart as he grabs woman by the arm to force her to leave ringside. But at this point, Chris Benoit dodging an Alex Wright dropkick in the ring and then landing a Pescado, a slingshot body block out to the floor on to Dean Malenko. So Benoit attacking the man of a thousand holds on the floor and the two men go at it ringside here as the Crippler whipping Malenko into a palm tree. Yes, a legitimate palm tree in the aisle way. You don't see that very often. So Benoit brawling with Dean Malenko and he winds up counted out. Alex Wright going to get the count out win here in eight minutes and 18 seconds. Apparently the referee steering directly at it 
not going to call for the disqualification here as Benoit basically taking it to Dean Malenko. And that will continue to set up their matchup upcoming here this weekend, this Saturday night, as part of the Hog Wild pay per view. But the action continues here this week on Nitro. Back to the ring, it's Lord Steven Regal, Jeeves by his side, taking on the Macho Man Randy Savage as Shivani puts over the loyalty of the Macho Man to WCW. But Larry Zabisco says, DTA, Tony, don't trust anyone, especially the unhinged Randy Savage as they continue to sell the speculation of the fourth man in the NWO. It's Steve Regal with some fun takeovers early on and even pushing up the bicep to pose to taunt the macho man. And it works as Savage takes over and we begin the countdown to hour number two when Tony Schiavone is alerted. There's no Eric Bischoff. There's no Bobby Heenan. So they tell Tony this with like 20 seconds notice. They just now realize this that Eric Bischoff and Bobby Heenan are missing in action. So it appears Shivani and Zabisco going to stay on as we start our number two mid-match here with Savage and Regal brawling on the floor. We see a shot of Sting and Lex Luger making their way out to ringside, taking seats in those empty chairs in the front row. I suppose they're going to act as extra security here for their buddy the Macho Man is back in the ring. It is back and forth. The Macho Man even whipping Regal into the empty seats at ringside at one point. Fun spot there. And then back inside the ring yet again. Regal wisely ducking a clothesline, but he catches one from the back. Boomerang style. Aha! Uh-huh. Clotheslining the back of the head of Regal. Didn't duck out of that one. Aha! Uh-huh. And the flying elbow drop. Going to get the win here for Randy Savage. Six minutes and 18 seconds. And then post match, Lex Luger and Sting. Now going to head over to the parked limo. They're going to even open the door. Now, is that breaking and entering or carjack? I'm not really sure. Well, Luger and Sting make it to the limo, and Stinger going to open the door. And once inside, what does Sting find? Not who does he find, but what does he find? A bouquet of flowers, dying flowers, with a sign that reads, Condolences on the death of WCW. All righty. And then we go back to the ring. Mean Gene standing by with an interview with the Macho Man Randy Savage and Sting and Lex Luger going to join back at ringside here with that bouquet of flowers. And Mean Gene going to get himself over here wearing somewhat of a gray suit this week, telling a fan to knock it off with the Matlock jokes. I appreciate that line anyway. As we learn now that the Macho Man originally scheduled for a special interview at the Hog Wild pay-per-view, he's now barred from the pay-per-view. Boo. But Savage says he cut a deal to meet the Giant or Hulk Hogan for the WCW title very soon. I wrote, hmm, a world title match already announced for a top star. He's going to meet whoever the champion is coming out of a pay-per-view. Sounds very familiar to what we just saw on Raw with Ahmed Johnson getting that title shot against Sean or Vader after SummerSlam. And now all three of the top baby faces in the ring with Mean Gene. They read the note on the flowers. As Sting points out that WCW, it's not dead. Sting then holds the flowers for Savage to punt kick out of the ring. Three points. Uh Aha. And as this happens, the limo pulls off. Who's giving this guy direction? As we head into a commercial break, the card, the flowers, not even original guys. Jim Cornette actually did this in real life. Legit. To Jim Hurd, like five years prior condolences on the death of WCW. You did a great job burying the company, Jim Hurd. So remember, guys, we're already into hour number two. It has already started. As we see a clip from Saturday night, it was Ric Flair taking on Chavo Guerrero Jr. Flair refusing to release the figure for a leg lock until Eddie Guerrero made the save. Eddie's going to be challenging Flair for that U.S. title at Hog Wild. We even hear a quick Guerrero promo here. They came to WCW to make their mark. But Ric Flair, he added fuel to Eddie's fire. And Eddie's going to come for that United States title. And then back to the ring for the U.S. champion, Ric Flair out here with woman Miss Elizabeth and Deborah McMichael going to take on the Booty Man, Brutus Beefcake. Booty Man out here with, oh, the lovely booty babe, Kimberly. I wrote, he's still here? I didn't remember Booty Man being here this long, and I didn't remember this angle until I watched it. Shows how well it's stuck in my memory. 
I guess there's just some people or some things you try to forget. But here we go. Booty Man here and still with Kimberly. And speaking of Kimberly, go back and watch this yourself. I'm not seeing things. I know I'm not making this up. Kimberly knows her days on the forefront are over or something along those lines. And she is just going through the motions during this entrance. She's doing what's asked of her, saying words like bootyful, but the smile, it's gone. And the energy, the Kimberly energy is gone as well. She's really checked out here emotionally. It feels like someone gave her the bad news right before she went out. But hey, there's always the Nitro Girls. And after Flair's entrance to the ring, we see Arn Anderson make his way out. And for a split second, I thought he had a rifle in his hand, but turns out it was just a steel chair. Double A out here, no doubt, to watch the Nature Boys back. And I should note that Arn has his left arm taped up after that NWO attack last week, so he is indeed playing the injury up. And in reality, there may be a whole lot more to the injuries of Arn Anderson as Bobby Heenan finally shows up ringside for commentary. He says he doesn't know what's going on. He's been waiting for Eric Bischoff in the back. Bobby's been waiting with his thumb up his, in his mouth. Thank you, Bobby. It's a family show. But nobody ever showed up, and he hasn't been given any direction. Yep, sounds like WCW to me. And then back to the ring. Ric Flair attacks Brother Brudai and works him over outside the ring, and then back inside when we see a shot of Chris Benoit and Steve McMichael now in the aisle way as well, so there's horsemen everywhere. As Rick, with a direct low blow to Beefcake, and lays in the chops as well in the corner, Booty Man finally fights back, but Flair doesn't appear to want to sell too much here, though he does do the Flair bump in the corner, and Brudai gonna charge into the corner, but missing a high knee, or rather the high knee, get it, high knee, yeah. Anywho, Beefer missing the knee in the corner and Flair capitalizing, locking in the figure four leg lock immediately and then blatantly using the ropes for leverage. Referee Randy Eller has to be blind not to see it. And finally, with Booty locked in the leg lock, rather than get the submission win, the horsemen hit the ring full force. Mongo and Benoit attack Booty, drawing the disqualification in just three minutes even. And then Bobby Heenan on commentary, he's seen enough chaos, leaving ringside yet again this week as the horsemen try to break the leg of the booty man. And even though the Dungeon of Doom, Ming and Barbarian, Bubba too, all out at ringside, they do nothing because of that WCW pact that was made and they allow the horsemen to destroy the booty man. As the attack goes on, Flair tries to dislocate the leg of Beefcake as Arn Anderson drives the chair across the knee of the beefer repeatedly. Mean Gene, finally the voice of reason, hits the ring, ordering the horseman to stop. But Flair reapplies the figure four again as Gene instructs them to stop the carnage. Ha! And Gene in the ring for his own reasons. He's going to interview the horseman here, and we get a great line here. Gene says last week Arn Anderson was the victim, but this week he was the perpetrator. As Anderson talks, his life flashing before his eyes last week as WCW was driven together, not by philosophy, but by necessity. He warns the outsiders, if you're going to take a baseball bat to a horseman, you better finish the job. Arn says there's one rule in gang fighting. They send one of yours to the hospital, you send one of theirs to the morgue. Benoit then takes over here, rambling out about something like Vengeance Unleashed. Mongo, too, warning the NWO, baby doll. And while the horsemen are cutting a promo, we see a shot of Ric Flair on the outside, stomping down the booty man one more time, sending a message by taking out Hulk Hogan's longtime friend. Flair then in the ring, taking over the promo. He says that, Hulk Hogan, you woke up one day and thought you'd become a bad man? Well, Flair's been a bad man since day one. The Outsiders, they tried to take out Arn last week. Well, there's your best friend, Hogan, pointing outside to the booty man. So even though Brutus Beefcake showed no allegiance to the NWO, Flair making his point, and point well received. And they knocked the dust off the booty man character just long enough to write him off for good. The character, not the wrestler. As we go back now to highlights from last week's attack, the outsiders attacking several WCW stars, in the backstage area, Larry Zabisco has some comments about the 
real New World Order. He goes on about a 666 on the back of Hogan's head, the Lake of Fire. Zabisco getting really prophetic here this week. As we go on, the following announcement, guys, paid for by the New World Order. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. And there it is, another NWO promo. The Outsiders mock attacking Sting by his car and attacking the wrestlers on Nitro last week. Hulk Hogan says he will beat the Giant on August the 10th, and the next day just happens to be the Hulkster's birthday, brother. And they go on, putting over the NWO, when the video abruptly freezes and cuts back to Tony and Larry at ringside and a female producer who scurries away yet again. We've seen her do that before, and it was cool and real the first time we saw it, but let's not beat a dead horse, guys. And we then cut to the production truck. We see Sting and Lex Luger instructing, now ordering them to stop playing the NWO tape. So now they're really just as guilty as the outsiders here in trying to control television. But it was a commercial paid for by the New World Order, meaning WCW had no option but to air it. They try to explain to Sting and Luger, well, they do have the option to say no, but apparently WCW wanted that money. Back to the announcers, Zabisco agrees with Sting and Lex. Why play the video? As Tony explains to Larry, the television business, and how they bought their TV time. But Tony does agree. Send them their money back. Fuck them, the slapdicks. The preceding announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. So we're off to our next matchup this week. WCW champion The Giant readying himself for Hulk Hogan at Hog Wild. Here this week, The Giant going to take on the Pitbull. Craig Pittman accompanied to the ring by Teddy Long. As the Giant physically breaks a waist lock early on and drives his hip back into Pittman before stepping on him and choking him with a boot in the corner. The champion then missing a butt butt in the corner and the Pitbull finally fires off a torpedo headbutt. Always loved that move when Pittman did it. The torpedo headbutt to the gut, but the Giant, he barely moves. So the Pitbull gonna try it a second time and he lands it. A second torpedo headbutt and again, the giant barely budges. So what's Craig going to do? Pittman looking for a third headbutt, but runs right into a giant choke slam instead. And the giant going to pick up the quick win here. Two minutes and 33 seconds over Pittman. But he's not done yet. The WCW champion wanting to prove a point to Hulk Hogan. Going to make his own statement here. Looking for another choke slam on the Pitbull. But it's Teddy Long in the ring pleading with the champion. So instead, the Giant shows mercy on Pittman, but then grabs Long instead and choke slams the manager who dead weights the Giant here, Teddy Long, eating the choke slam. So another message sent the way of Hulk Hogan and the New World Order. As Tony Schiavone again clarifies what the Macho Man touched on earlier, the winner of the Hulk and Giant match at Hogwild will indeed have to defend their title against the Macho Man Randy Savage very soon. And then after the matchup, Mean Gene hopping in the ring, going to have a word with the Giant and his manager, Jimmy Hart, here. Hart says that when he managed Hulk Hogan, everybody told the Hulkster what he wanted to hear. But Jimmy, he was the only one that told him the truth. But Hogan never wanted to listen to the truth, and he's telling Hogan right now. He's never lied to the Hulkster, and he's not going to begin now. He's warning Hogan to beware of the Giant at Hogwild. And once again, we see the black limousine. It's returning. Oh, goody. The giant warning anyone who gets in his way, including Mean Gene or even Jimmy Hart, his own manager. The NWO has had their fun the last couple weeks here, but he says their 15 minutes of fame are up at Hog Wild. Another good promo this week by the giant. He's really been coming into his own with promos lately. And hey, it's that Glacier promo again, so we'll skip that and move right into the main event here this week on WCW Nitro. It's Sting and Lex Luger taking on the Nasty Boys. We saw their altercation early on as we get a clip from two weeks ago on WCW Saturday night. It was the Nasty taking on Sting and the Macho Man, Randy Savage. Macho brings the Halliburton to ringside with him that he took away from the Horseman, and Nobbs winds up using the briefcase first, but it's Stinger using it right back, clocking Nobbs with it, and the Sting Macho Man combination going to get the win there as Deborah McMichael and Mongo run out to steal back their briefcase, baby doll. 
So Sting and Macho Man scoring a win there over the Nasty Boys using a foreign object. Now, be, to be fair, Nobbs brought it into the ring first. And I should mention, Tony and Larry on commentary here spend the entire second hour speculating on what happened to Eric Bischoff. Larry says, he's not here, so something clearly happened to him, and it doesn't look good. And much like Sting and Lex watched the back of the Macho Man earlier, it's the Steiners out now to watch the backs of Sting and Lex Luger. So the dudes with attitude back in full force. Hell yeah. As the Nasties get the best of Lex early on, running him over with a double shoulder tackle and working him over in their corner, but Nobbs missing a corner charge and Lex with a clothesline to both of the Nasty Boys before tagging in to the Stinger. And then Sting going to work on Nobbs, but he gets tripped up on the floor by Sags and the Nasties back in control with a little clubbering, if you will, four fifthesses. That's four fistesses on the Stinger here as Sags with a stiff clothesline into the corner on Sting, and the Nasty is going to continue the legal double teaming here. Hey, they got a five count, guys. And it's Nobbs off the middle rope, but lands right into Sting's knee, or boot, or something. Either way, Sag's going to tag in, but it allows Sting time to make the hot tag out to Lex Luger. As Luger in with clotheslines to both of the Nasty Boys, power slam on Jerry Sags, Luger scooping Sags up into that torture rack, but Nobbs attacks from behind to prevent it, leading to a four-way melee. And Sags and Luger brawling out to the floor. Sags rushing at Lex, but Luger ducks. And Sags accidentally nailing Rick Steiner, who was standing ringside acting as security. But Sags brushes it off, turns around looking for a pile driver on the total package on the outside. But Rick Steiner, he didn't forget about it, blasting Sags on the floor with a Steiner line. Luger then rolling Sags back inside the ring with the illegal man Sting locking in the Scorpion Deathlock. And it's Sting and Luger picking up the submission win here with the Scorpion. Seven minutes and five seconds. So technically, the Nasties, they got robbed there. But I'm good with that. As we close out this edition of Nitro, Mean Gene Oakland in the ring one final time. Going to talk to Sting and Lex Luger heading into the Hog Wild pay per view this coming weekend. Some kids flex with Sting and Lex. Before they talk, hog wild. Stinger pondering if the NWO is actually in the limo this time. Remember it left and now it's returned. And they decide this could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Sting thinks they need to go check it out. So off they go over to the limo yet again to check things out. This time when they open the door, someone tosses a bag at them and then slams the door back shut before we can see who's inside. And as Stinger holds the bag, both literally and figuratively, Nitro comes to an end. As Mean Gene shouts, What the hell is that? Well, it's, it's a fucking bag, Gene. And as I said, no payoffs here back in 1996. But if you guys really want to know what was in the bag, do you really want to know what was in the bag? Okay, I'll tell you. Ha! Call the hotline! Gotcha, guys. 1-900-909-9900. Kids, get your parents' permission, or don't. I don't really give a fuck, because I make a percentage of every call you make. So take that. Ha! Ah! Oh, mean Gene. But wait, guys. We have exclusive content from the Peacock version of the show. Don't change that dial. Forget who was in the limo. What is in the bag? Additional content. A true exclusive, people. The cameras kept rolling, much as Tony has taught us for more than a decade at this point. And what's in the bag? Stinger opens it to find... Oh, the suspense. It's... 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 NWO Flyers, brother. They read, See you in Sturgis. Because I guess the NWO knew who was going to read the Flyers? And remember, we're off air at this point, so we can hear Sting and Luger mocking the NWO for not having the logo on the bag, but rather using a Turner logo instead. I wrote LOL. So what you gonna do? What a payoff. We were better off never even knowing. Nevertheless, I'll see you guys in Sturgis for WCW Hogwild on the next edition of Monday Warfare as we talk the fallout from the pay-per-view and head into the August 12th edition of both Raw and Nitro. And as we wrap up Nitro, we're gonna talk segment of the night. So many matches here this week. There was really no Hall, Nash, or Hogan on the show outside of that paid announcement. 
So security worked here, you would have to think. And I can't really pick out a, a particular segment that blew my mind this week. There wasn't one really great match, one really great angle, one really great promo. It was just kind of there. It wasn't a bad Nitro, but it was just a whole lot of middling, if you know what I mean. So the Harlem Heat Rock and Roll Express was better than I expected it to be, though it was nowhere near a, a rock and roll type classic, if you will. And of course, I, I enjoyed the Medusa Malaya Hosaka match as well, although that wasn't very long either. It's hard to give anything on this show the segment of the night. I could go Medusa and Malaya Hosaka because it was the best thing for me on the program, but also Alex Wright and Chris Benoit had a fun little match. I love the little thing with Benoit and Malenko at the end to set up the, their matchup, the final lead in to their match at the pay per view. Of course, Malenko getting thrown into a palm tree. But yeah, it's hard to pick a segment of the night. I wasn't really into that Sting and Luger Nasty Boys match at all. Another good angle here with Flair and the Booty Man. Flair proving a point, making a statement to Hulk Hogan hey, you take out one of mine, I'm going to take out one of yours. So segment of the night, I don't really have one. If you ask me for an angle, I'll go Flair and Booty Man, really. If you ask me for a match, maybe Medusa and Malaya Hosaka, maybe the Rock and Roll Express and Harlem Heat. It probably would have been Benoit and Alex Wright had we got an actual finish in the ring. And the ratings are in. And this week, Monday Night Raw, closing the gap with a 2.8 rating to Nitro's 3.0. Ooh, almost neck and neck here this week. After a couple of good weeks of Raw in a row, they're getting some of the viewers back. And with WCW not paying things off, that could be costing them as well. So it's Raw with a 2.8, Nitro with a 3.0 here. And upon closer observation, the WWF had a lot of reasons for optimism, while WCW certainly had reasons for concern because Nitro opened the first hour with a 2.5 rating, and that did jump up to a 3.0 in the second 15-minute segment, and it continued to build all the way up to a 3.3 and a 3.4 rating in the second two quarters of the first hour of the program. But in the second hour, Nitro began dropping versus Raw this week. Raw opened with a 2.2, but it grew steadily through each quarter. Went from a 2.2 to a 2.3, and then it jumped all the way up for the Battle Royal to a 3.4 and finally ending with a 3.5. So Raw jumping up almost a whole point for that Battle Royal, while Nitro dropped steadily 3.4, 3.2, and then it drops almost a full point to 2.6 for the last half hour of the show. Nitro does beat Raw here, 3.0 to 2.8, but if you're just counting that second hour, Raw did a damn fine job. Because in that final half hour of TV, Raw indeed did beat Nitro by nearly an entire point. Nitro continuing their teasing of major angles that never happen, while Raw had a hot battle royal loaded with big names. The winner to main event on Raw the following night after SummerSlam taking on the WWF champion in just two weeks' time. And this is the best Raw has looked since Nitro went to two hours. Good job here by Vince McMahon and company. And for 1996, it's basically also a dead heat at this point, averaging out WCW averaging at 3.0 ratings for the year so far and a 4.8 share, while Raw averaging 2.9 and a 4.4 share. So only a tenth of a point difference thus far, averaging things out for the entire year between Nitro and Raw. And since WCW started the two-hour format, right now it's averaging a 3.1 rating. So the rating's slightly up for WCW in the last couple months, but not this week, guys. Barely beating out Raw here. And the real winner? Well, Raw literally had a two-match show, unless you really want to count that Lawler-Aldo-Montoya thing, but for the third week straight, they used every segment wisely. The Battle Royal was loaded with names and heated up some of the rivalries as well, heading into SummerSlam, especially Mankind and The Undertaker, but even Sid and the Bulldog we saw there. Meanwhile, Nitro, it had a better mix this week with more action that focused a lot on Hog Wild, or I should say, for certain matches at Hog Wild. And growing up, you automatically think two hours of wrestling has to be better than one. Well, we all have learned that three hours of TV wrestling is not better than two. In two hours, it does seem perfect, but that's twice as much time to continue to try to entertain people. So WCW in a little bit of a hole here, even though got to love the two hours. You have to think that on WCW's end, the false promises and the never-ending teasing with little to no payoffs it has begun 
Who is in the limo? Who is the fourth man? Where is Eric Bischoff? They answered none of these questions this week, by the way. There was no Hogan live, and likely due to movie commitments, but also no Hall, no Nash outside of that VTR. And there's just no excuse for that leading into the pay-per-view. But that'll wrap it up for this week, guys. When we return, it'll be the fallout from Hog Wild as we head into SummerSlam over on the WWF side of things. A reminder to go check out the WrestleCopia podcast network located over at WrestleCopia.com. Also follow me on social media on Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade and on Twitter at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And last but certainly not least, Give our Patreon a try over at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. The $5 all-access tier gets you all sorts of goodies, guys. And every penny of it, every penny you put in, goes right back here into paying the bills to keep the WrestleCopia podcast network up and running for the months and the years to come. So I want to thank you guys so very much once again. And we'll be back soon with the August 12th edition of the Monday Night War here. And I am your host, Ray Russell, as this has been another edition of Monday Warfare, The Battles Within. <laughs> <laughs>